Dualism in the Ambient World, a Principle for Organizing Reality. Hello. In this presentation, we're going to be talking about one of the most important concepts that articulate the what we've been talking about, what we've been calling the Andean worldview, and that is dualism. The idea that there are two different elements that are complementary and that must interact at all levels in order to bring things to productivity, to bring things to life. This principle is very ancient and it goes way before the Inca times. So in this image that we have here from uh, a pectoral piece from the Chavin culture, this culture uh, started this culture develop is one of the most important pre-Incan cultures perhaps the one that gave most of the uh, cultural social characteristics that we associate with Andean culture can be traced back to the Chavin organization. So Chavin started around a thousand years before common era and it lasted until the fifth century before common era. And in this pectoral piece, we can see two elements that reflect each other in some type of mirror image. What we can see here is how the most likely a condor face, if not a condor, maybe a harpy eagle, which was very commonly represented in the Chavin culture. You have this figure and then you have the one at the bottom which is the mirror image. If we can, if we, if you just turn your head upside down, you're gonna notice that these two images, they look as if they can be open in this way. So here, all of them are mirror images of each other. So this idea of complementarity between two equally important or perfectly symmetrical elements is one of the things that you can find in the Chavin culture, in the Chavin architecture. For instance, their main temple has an entrance that is divided in half. One half is white and the other half is black. Of course, now you don't see it as completely white. It has been, you know, the stones are, the stone material is clearer, it's lighter in color, but it's clearly different from the other half. And also each one on this entrance, you can see that there is a column on each side. And one of the columns has a, a masculine anthropom anthropom anthropomorphized bird and then the other one has the exact has a similar bird but with female characteristics so what we can say is that this dualism has been represented in andean art way before the inca empire and which makes us believe that this principle was pan-andean and of very very ancient origin at the level of the ilu we can see the, the main community, the basic community that compose the, that it still composes Andean communities or the Andean social life. We can see that dualism has played an important role in the way they were organized. Every Ailu was divided in two sides, two halves or moieties. The senior Saya was usually the senior Saya or the senior part of the Ailu, the senior half was considered to have a closer relationship with the hero who founded the town, who, sorry, who established the town, who established the community. And the lower, the lower uh, Saya, the lower moiety, the lower half, was considered to be equal in importance or equal in terms of nature, but one of them was considered to be prime, primary or more, I don't want to say the word more important, but in reality, it is a, a difference of hierarchy that we've been talking about. So by being closer to this ancient hero, they could claim precedence from the other half. But important to be stressed is that no element, sorry, no part of this ilu, no half of this ilu could be considered to exist without the other. They're mutually complementary. The dual system also implied that the ilu itself had more than one leader, more than one curaca. Remember the word curaca means originally the, the elder one, the most important, the curaca, the one who is the, the elder in the family. But at the same time, there was another curaca or another leader, which in ancient times, in ancient times, you know, when the Inca Empire started, for instance, we have documentation for that, was called the Sinchi. 
to the point this is this is fairly clear when you see the names of the first Inca here, Manco Capac, and the second Inca ruler, his son, called Sinchi Roca. What we have here is that the very likely the Sinchi was the community leader in terms of conflict, in, in times of conflict, in time in times of war. Whereas the Curaca was mainly uh, having functions for during the peace times to conduct production, taxation, redistribution of goods, etc. So it was important to understand that this opposition between sides that makes who together which together make a whole, it's what defines the life of the community and they are seen as complementary opposites. They are complementary opposites at the at several points. For instance, the basic job distinction uh, could be traced back to this complementarity between pastoral work, shepherds, and agricultural work, horticultures, peasants. So both are very different styles of work, but both as, as, uh, are seen as complementary because they take advantage of two equally complementary parts of the terrain, the higher part of the terrain and the lower part of the terrain. We see again how geography provides a clue to how they organize the to how they organize society. In addition to this, we have the economic production, AIMI or reciprocity, is by, uh, is by definition a dual notion. If I work for you, you will work for me. It's mutual complementarity. In addition to this, social interactions imply competi competitiveness. And, comp and competitiveness is very important to understand how two elements are different and they engage in some type of ritualistic conflict that brings life to, fru to, uh, to fruition. Finally, political functions are also based or they take advantage of this dual distinction or this dual division. And we have the taxation and redistribution usually divide the communities in two parts and they can in that so that they can keep a better census so that they can determine who is responsible for each one of these parts. The dual structure of the Ailu was so important that even in the capital of the Inca Empire, the city of Cusco, the Inca nobility was organized as if they were the two parts, the two sayas of an Ailu. And so we had the division between the upper Cusco zone and the lower Cusco zone. So we can see that the, uh, the low Cusco zone was considered, was the side of town where the original five Inca kings had their palaces and had their descendants living in their families. And that was called a panaca in, in, in Quechua. So the first dynasties, the first five Inca rulers, they belong to the low Cusco, to the to the low Cusco uh, or the down Cusco uh, dynasty, the Urin Cusco. And then the following Incas, until the, the conquest of the Spaniards, they belong to the upper higher to the upper side of, of Cusco, the ha the Hanan Cusco dynasty. This part of the city was called Jaucapata. And this was the main square. And as you can see, it united both the upper side here, the Hanan Cusco, as well as the Uring side, the lower Cusco. The, the form of these, uh, this main square was an inverted U, which in itself represented two sides, one that was to the left and to the right, or one that was more accurately to the upper side and to the lower side, and both were connected by some type of bridge. So those were the two sides connected. And it was a sacred space for performance of rituals, which brought together the two sides of the community, in this case, the community of the people of royal, um, of, of, of royal descent. Let's take a look at one of the most interesting uh, documents from the uh, 17th century. One of the most interesting documents that was produced by an indigenous uh, member of the nobility of the Inca empires, Juan de Santa Cruz Pachacuti. He was most likely a member of a nobility from the Coliasuyo 
one of the sites of the Inca Empire that was towards the east around the Titicaca Lake, the high Andean Plateau, the Altiplano region. In his book called the Re La Relación de las Antigüedades de este Reino del Perú, the story of the antiquities of this uh, kingdom of Peru, approximately in 1620 was written by him, uh, Juan de Santa Cruz Pachacuti did this sketch that you're seeing right here, which is nothing but, which according to him, was the representation engraved in a big, um, let's see, in a big, in a big gold plate, on a big gold plate, was this representation of the universe as the Inca uh, ruling class envisioned it. So, of course, we are not going to be able to take a look at all the detail because, believe me, this thing has been researched in a very extensive way since the beginning of modern history and then history. But we can see here, for instance, the sun, the moon, a series of stars, and here are an old... Uh, system that you know, the Kolka stars, the Pleiades. Here you have the Chacana stars, which actually were not exactly a cross, as they said. Those were those were seen more as the as two bridges that cross each other. So this is a bridge and this one is another bridge. And then you have a, a man, an hombre, mujer, man, woman. Here you have the ocean, Mamacocha. Here you have Mamapacha, Mother Earth, you have the lightning, and you have here what they call Colcapata, which is like a storage terrace. And here you have an, a tree called Malki, which is the, the tree that bears fruit. And here is the Chokechinchai, or the Ocelot, a small um, uh, jaguar-like mammal that lives in the Amazon region or in, in the, uh, the Piedmont. Etc. You have other um, atmospheric phenomenon too, like uh, hail, uh, rain, the um, the rainbow, etc. There are many interpretations by different people who have studied uh, Andean history, uh, ethno history, and we are going to follow a little bit more closely Professor Jan Zeminski's interpretation of the duality that these. Um, that this representation of the main altar of the Coricancha, the temple of the sun, or the main temple of the Inca Empire, had. So, in this representation, Professor Seminsky is following the ideas, the guiding principle, uh, duality between male and female. And the male principle is assumed to be the more active principle, and it's also assumed to be the most positive one in terms of being good luck, for instance, or being the more proactive one, the one that produces something effectively. But the other element or the other way, uh, the other principle, the feminine principle, is considered to be not necessarily passive, but indispensable to bring, it's like a catalyst, that is the point. A catalyst is not active. But without its interaction with another thing, it cannot, the change will not happen. So the point is that, yes, it has less agency, correct, and is also connected to more negative notions such as bad luck, for instance, or uh, more destructive forces. So, for instance, hail is on the right side, hail is on the, le on the left side. The left side is the feminine side, the right side is the masculine side. So, having mentioned that, uh, this distinction right and left, feminine, masculine, right, masculine, feminine, left side, we can also see that this uh, map of reality, this cosmology, has three areas. An upper one, and this is a point that divides, and this is another point that divides this world here, called Kaipacha or the reality that we have here, this world, literally. And then there is the Hanan Pacha. Now you know the distinction between Hanan above, up, and Urin below. And this is the Urin Pacha, the below world, the underworld. This distinction, this threefold division has been discussed as perhaps uh, 
influence of Christianity, but other people, other, other um, archaeologists, well, not archaeologists, historians, ethnohistorians, and anthropologists, they believe that this distinction was in fact uh, was in fact original from from Andean thinking. And what we can see here is that in the upper world, we have the the main elements or the the main factors that interact with this part of the world to bring life. For instance, uh, the distribution of the stars that we mentioned before, they can find their reflection in this world here, okay, so that the animals and the things living there are capable of participating from the, the force that comes from this upper side of the world. We see here all the stars and the, the sun, the sun here, the moon, and the, uh, the Chacana cross. But as I mentioned, it is considered to be two bridges that are overimposed with each other. So they are conducting to all the possible places. The interesting thing here is that, as you may have noticed, the, um, how would I put it, the, the natural phenomena that directly affects crops is not all the way here. This is the upper world is more of a symbolic, allegoric level that brings power to the real world. Whereas these things here, like Iliapa, the thunder, uh, Kuichi, the rainbow, the uh, Apukyo, well, Apukyo is a, a water spring, or hail, for instance, the one, the, the Chokechincha, this idol is the one that brings the frozen hail. So all of these things, they belong to this world, to the world of humans. So the interaction between them and us is way more, is much more constant, and they impact directly our lives. However, the way in which these things interact are represented again by the masculine principle and the feminine principle. So because of that, you can see how you have the Pilkomayu, like a zigzagging uh, river, a more powerful river with more water, is opposing to the creek, a little river with less power, which is on the feminine side. But, this is, but both are equally necessary. That is the point here. Both are equally necessary. Uh, then another interesting or important element is that everything that is on the underworld is also an important part, is connected to our world. So the upper world and the lower world interact with our world in a way that we can really see. For instance, the uh, the Malki, the Malki tree. I'm gonna write it here. Quechua Malki. The Malki is a tree that is considered important because it's the tree that bears fruit. So in that sense, the underworld is the part of our universe that produces wealth. Is the part that is indispensable and dispensable. To produce what we consume and that is the idea of the Malki also as the the mummy of the ancestor. Malki was a word, a word that was used to, to refer to the tree that bears fruit but also it was used to talk about for instance the mummy of the Inca. The idea is that this object that this natural object produced descendants and those descendants came sprouted let's put it like that into the world, into this world, the world in between, our reality. Finally, also considered as a part of the underworld is the so-called Kolkapata or the agricultural terrace, a part that is, on, that is above to protect it from humidity, upper, a higher level is drier, it's colder too, and that preserves all the, 
preserve the fruit, preserve the grains, the potatoes in a better way. So even if that it's supposed to be above ground, in the Andean worldview, represented here in this um, in this sketch that Juan de Santa Cruz, Juan Santa Cruz Pachacuti did, is underworld because of the most likely because of the relation grain and fruit has with seeds they could be used for planting so they are connected to the underworld too let's take a quick look at the gender relations uh, the gender relations in the santa cruz pachacuti's drawing of the andean cosmology uh, i'm gonna follow uh, irene silverblatt 1987 study the important thing here is to notice how the main uh, or the, the central part of this right masculine and the left feminine sides of the of the drawing of Santa Cruz Pachacuti. This is the masculine side and this is the feminine side. In between them is the central area that synthesizes both complementary opposites. And uh, in the drawing itself, the creating deity, the god of the, the main creating god in the Andean world was called Wiracocha. And Wiracocha was represented as an oval. This oval was a combination of both genders. And the idea is this, um, this bisexuality or this bigenderism, speaking, you know, in a very old terms of Wiracocha was nothing but the result of being a creating deity, being capable of bringing life without interacting with, without interacting with anybody else besides himself or itself. So in that sense, Wiracocha was a, a very particular deity. In the same, on the same, on the same vein, the Colcapata, the storage terrace, or the uh, the storage uh, terrace, this yeah, the, well, the storage terrace, is the place where you have where you can bring the um, the fruits of the uh, of the harvest. You can bring all the grains. You can bring the potatoes. These places were located above, as I mentioned before, and even though they were they were placed in this in this upper side. They contain seeds for the next season. So this, the product, the product of all the interaction between men, women, water, earth, and all these complementary principles, are the fruits. And in that sense, they are considered to have this dual nature, and they are placed in between this schema, this uh, diagram of the universe. So what we see here is also that these complementary opposites, the sun, the moon, masculine sun, feminine, the moon, the morning star, the evening star, the morning star giving us the time in which we have to start our labor, our, our labor, our work. The evening star start when everything ends, you know, when the, the nighttime has come. The male earth and the mother sea. The male earth is an interesting notion in this, uh, in this approach that silver blood has because the male earth is most likely, in my opinion, the result of this official theology, this official cosmology of the Inca Empire that Santa Cruz Pachacuti was trying to represent or was trying to, to register for posterity. So what I mean here is that the complementarity between water, the mother sea is the mother of all the waters, and mother and the earth, Mother Earth in popular terms, the way we understand it, Pachamama, that is the thing that ends up producing material elements that, it, that, it, that are taken advantage of for our nurturance. So when you put water, the water dissolves, the water gets absorbed, and in that sense is a less active principle, whereas the thing that grows, that sprouts from Earth, is a more active principle, is a more active entity. Because of that, it could be said that Mother Earth has masculine properties because it's proactive, it's, it's more positive, it's less a catalyst as the elements that are on the feminine side. However, as I've been repeating, 
catalysts are indispensable for creation for the creation of life. So the synthetic entities are bigendered and they go in between and the masculine ones go to the right, the feminine ones go to the left. This notion of complementary opposites is best instantiated or is best represented by conflict. And fertility, fertility is necessarily the result of some type of conflict. Fertility as a signifier of life cannot be understood without death. And that is the most extreme representation or the most extreme consequence of conflict. Therefore, when we talk about opposition and resolution, we are thinking primarily of the agrarian process and also the interaction between male and female, which is capable of bearing fruit. Anything that is produced comes to an end and dies. But without death, then there cannot be life. And those ritual fights are the symbolism, they are the symbolic expression of this opposition, opposition taken to the extreme, taken to extreme. So in that sense, and the picture here shows the uh, Atinku in the uh, Potosi province in Bolivia. It's an individual match where people, young people, start fighting against each other for this ritual purpose, to shed some blood to ensure fertility of Mother Earth. And uh, Paul Gellis, which I'm, who I'm following uh, in, this, um, in this part, he summarizes the notion of dualism in this way. There are three, three ways in which we can understand dualism. A logical one, as if this is the principle that rules the universe, so there, is, there, there are things that we can see as male and female, right and left, up and down, that we can understand as, oh, this is such common way for things to happen, that this must be some type of essential characteristics. This should be an essential characteristic of the universe, the way it is organized. Another way in which we can talk about this is as if this... Um, the dual organization is a tool for exert power or is a political organization so that we can divide people, create identities, create competition, opposition, and complementarity, reciprocity in order to remain productive and survive. However, the most natural way to understand, according to Gellis, and I, and I agree with him, is that this dualism is nothing but the, con it's a cultural construction that mixes, that blends together the notion of fertility of earth as the most important nurturing principle or nurturing fact of, of nature. Things reproduce and we can take advantage of that to persist, to survive. That gets reinterpreted and re-symbolized in the way we act. And in that way, doing what these people do fighting in, in ritual battles is nothing but how humans take and repurpose a fact of life, life and death, and they bring it to some type of control, some type of performance in which they can feel as if they are represented, recreating the life that engulfs them, that, that contains them. Finally, even if Gallus mentioned that the, the, prefer, uh, the preferred approach is the cultural one where the observation of nature, the observation of life, inform the way we understand, we understand our own participation, our own action, our own plans towards how this fertility, this productivity needs to be enforced or enhanced. Even if that is the central way in which, in which duality became so pervasive throughout the Andes, it is also interesting to mention that the distinction between upper and lower could and, and it's likely to have been used as an imperial tool for the, uh, for the control of the population. And in this, in this sense, we can see that the division of the ILU between the upper half and the lower half was not necessarily something that happened spontaneously, or it, it was not necessarily, it didn't have to be something that was going to be found all around the Andes. In fact, 
it could be logically possible that other people, other communities, other cultures, other civilizations within the Andes, because the Andes are large enough and they have contained different civilizations, those civilizations could have had, could have had a different type of organization. However, Gales makes the argument that the permanence of the dual system during the Inca Empire and after that, it is nothing but the repurposing of this organization by colonialist powers. And in this case, the Inca, which were an empire and who took control over different territories and different states and different civilizations, and then the Spanish Empire, which conquered the Inca Empire. So for that reason, I'm following Gales here, the minorness of the Moaites in Andean communities during the Inca, Spanish, Inca and Spanish colonial times had nothing to do with this spontaneous organization or nor local preferences of any kind, marriage or other. The marriage is thrown in there just to, sim just to reflect the fact that people in the ILU, they tend to, some ILUs larger in, in, in number, they tend to remain together in an endogamic way. So they, uh, men and women, got together within the ILU. Some people were coming from the outside too, but the tendency was to keep things well organized within a certain ILU. And that necessity or that imposition of an organization that was very strictly followed is, it is due to the exigencies of an extractive, tributary, and administrative system organized along dual lines. So, in a nutshell, what we're seeing here is the possibility that besides the cultural nature of the, um, of the dual system, the Inca Empire and later the Spanish Empire decided that the way this was organized gave them the tool to create some type of civilization, some type of rule of life that made people behave within their own community to have a very well controlled interaction and that interaction ended up creating what a surplus that was redistributed towards the hierarchy within the ILU and then within the state and that surplus gave the rulers the possibility of redistributing gifts like textiles like animals like uh, ceramics etc to whomever they wanted to incorporate into the empire. So what we're looking at here is that the division between up, above, and below could also be used as a tool for control of population. I hope that this uh, presentation was clear to you guys. We were talking about uh, cosmology, how the principle of organizing the upper side and the lower side, or this dual division of reality, could be expressed in different ways in art, also in the way the idol is organized, in the way people do perform rituals to ensure fertility, and finally in the control of the state by the by, by those who are in the higher hierarchical level. Thank you very much.